Good afternoon, everybody. We might make a start. Um, I'm Peter Hudson on behalf of the Centre for Palliative Care. Welcome to this afternoon's forum. Um, I'd like to formally acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri Nation, and pay respect to their elders and families. So it's now my uh, great pleasure to introduce our main presenter, and it's Associate Professor Jenny Phillip. Jenny is the Deputy Director of Palliative Medicine here at St Vincent's Hospital and is co-deputy director of the Centre for Palliative Care, uh, which is a collaborative centre of the University of Melbourne. Jenny is a palliative care physician uh, with extensive experience, predominantly in hospital consultancy setting. Um, and Jenny's research agenda has largely focused on developing models of palliative care in COPD, glioma, aged care, and also in end of life care issues in the emergency department. Uh, Jenny is a very close colleague of mine and admired by many in the field for her wisdom. So please make her feel welcome. Thanks, Peter. And as I, Peter said, it's tremendous um, that people have come today. Thank you. Um, I hope it will be a, an interesting discussion. Um, I am going to take you on a bit of a cook's tour through um, some of the literature around sedation, both around the incidence, how we might define it or think about it, in particular sort of standardising some of the terms that we use, show you some of and present in a little bit of detail some guidelines that have been published, and I'm just focusing on one particular set of guidelines, although there are a number, some outcomes of what's been done. And then um, I really want to spend the second half of the session having a discussion with um, a panel around some cases that I think explores some of the practical issues that we, that we really encounter at the bedside when we're caring for people at the end of life. So I guess the first half is sort of conceptual and showing you and reminding us all what's in the literature. And the second half is the nitty gritty sort of what you do or what might one do. Um, and there's obviously potentially more than one way. In 1994, Vittoria Ventafrida um, from Italy published a study of home care patients in um, his home country and citing that 53% of these patients had sedation at the end of life. And I'm old enough to remember that. <laughs> and um, it actually created a bit of a fuss. People were sort of quite surprised that this figure was as high as that. And I'm just wondering, whilst sort of in the interests of straw polls, uh, what people, if they would reflect on their own practice of what might be the incidence of sedation in their own practice. And perhaps, you know, thinking about that, would you maybe put your hand up if you think it's maybe less than 10%? Anyone? Not many? Maybe 20 to 50%? Yeah, quite a few. More than 50%? Yeah, quite a few. Yeah, so there's a big spread. Um, and I think that this, and that's a big spread in the literature too, as you can see, 15 to 67% is cited. And I think this relates to a number of things, partly possibly because we're talking about different things. Um, what might be sort of considered sedation at the end of life to some might not be thought to be that. There's different approaches in the level, in the timing or the temporal nature of it, in the indications and methods. So the differing terms, um, all of these have been used, including total pharmacological sedation, which sort of gets a bit <laughs> uncomfortable, perhaps. Um, and I guess for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to use the term palliative sedation. There is different approaches, as said, about what is sedation. So in some of the studies, when people are reviewing the literature and citing this, they exclude mild sedation, or they're included in others. And some of them don't really define what what is going on at the bedside. They're just saying there's sedation. Levels of sedation might differ from perhaps mild or conscious sedation, which is when someone might be um, just a little bit sleepy or just a little bit, a bit of anxiolytic versus right through to perhaps deep sedation. As I said, temporal nature might differ. So it might be intermittent. Some people use the term temporary, respite, night sedation versus a continuous sedation. The medications used differ, and the target symptoms for which this might be done um, in the first instance or in the second instance appears to differ substantially. So Marisha in 2002 
undertook a systematic review of all the studies that they could determine which used sedative med medications or which included an intention to reduce consciousness. And they, in an attempt to try to standardise some of the language around this, they came up with this notion that sedation includes two core factors. Firstly, the presence of severe suffering refractory to standard palliative management. And secondly, the use of sed sedative medications with the primary aim to relieve distress. And then they came up with a sort of a slightly complex table. And you can see on the left is, um, first of all, the degree of sedation, which might be mild, whereby consciousness is maintained, or deep, whereby perhaps complete unconsciousness is achieved. The duration, again, intermittent or continuous. So intermittent is when there might be some times when the patient is still alert, and then other times when they're not. The pharmacological properties of the medication. So primary sedation, when the sedative medications are used for their sedative effect. They don't actually have an effect on the underlying symptom. So they're not a pain medication which in turn makes them sedated. It's actually a sedating medication versus a secondary one, which is obviously the latter. The symptoms, they suggested that if we're using this for symptoms, we need to describe these according to um, standard diagnostic criteria. And the target populations also should be described according, using validated tools, so performance status tools. So we're all comparing the same group of patients. Prognostic tools. We can get a sense of where the patient is in their illness. <coughs> Classens um, tried to classify this a little further, and this looks complicated, but actually I think when, as a clinician, it makes intuitive sense. So this is really a matrix of some of those levels of sedation and also the the temporal nature and then the reasons for doing it or the acute or non-acute reasons for doing it. So mild intermittent sedation is intermittent, mild reduction of consciousness, but the person's still reactive, probably still talking to you a little, versus mild continuous where the same sort of cog cognitive state but continuing on. Deep intermittent and non-acute. So starting to get complex, I know, but so there's intermittent reduction of consciousness for a non-acute refractory symptom. So perhaps a refractory dyspnea that you are um, looking to in induce short periods of, of reduced consciousness. And then during those times, the patient is deeply sedated. Um, deep intermittent acute. So this might be when a person has an acute event and you need to respond acutely and you need to help that patient, the way of responding is going to be for that patient to be asleep or unconscious. And then deep continuous non-acute, and that might be what you know some of us think about when we're talking about palliative sedation, that sort of ongoing sedation, usually until the end of life. Deep continuous acute, so in the sense of a catastrophic event, a haemorrhage, for example, where you need to respond and the patient needs to probably reach a level of unconsciousness to be comfortable until they die. So it does get sort of complex. Um, so I think using all of that sort of terminology and by way of background, Nathan Cherney on behalf of the European Association for Palliative Care came up with a definition, which is that palliative sedation is the monitored use of medications intended to induce a state of decreased or absent awareness in order to relieve the burden of otherwise intractable suffering in a manner that's ethically acceptable to the patient, family and healthcare <coughs> providers. So unpacking this, un intractable suffering is intolerable. So it's determined on the basis of the patient evaluation or if they're unable on their proxy in collaboration with staff and families. It's refractory. So all the sensible treatments that we have available have been tried and unhelpful based on skilled assessment, team consensus, and um, there doesn't seem to be another available treatment to reverse this, either within the time frame or within sort of a reasonable risk benefit ratio for the patient. And the goal is to relieve the burden of suffering. So following this, the European Association, along with some others, but I'm really, I guess, presenting the European guidelines, came up with guidelines. And you might say, well, why do we need guidelines? Well, I think that the guidelines are potentially or are, are useful because of the potential adverse outcomes and risks of sedation. First of all, the obvious risk of impairment, <laughs> loss of ability, family distress, 
Um, paradoxically, as you know, some people can get agitated. Um, and this risk of haste and death, which I'll come back to. And we need guidelines because there are problem practices, and, and I'm sure we all know that. There are clinicians who um, abuse this approach, and in fact their intention is to hasten death, either through excessive dose or use of sedation in the presence of no symptoms. Um, there's injudicious, injudicious use of palliative sedation, or indeed of withholding palliative sedation. And indeed, there's substandard um, clinical practice around describing some of the populations, what might be the indications. Has this patient really been through um, the best treatment that we can, that can provide? So I want to walk you through the EAPC framework for procedural guidelines. It's a little dry, so bear with me. Um, but I hope that highlighting some of these things that might come up in the discussion later. So firstly, these guidelines recommend preemptive discussion of the role of sedation in end-of-life care and contingency planning. And I must say, this is not something that I routinely do, um, but it'd be interesting if you know, people in, in the audience actually do do this or, or practice this step differently. Secondly, they recommend describing the indications in that service whereby sedation might be considered. And they suggest if distress is intolerable due to physical symptoms or refractory symptoms, um, they suggest using continuous deep sedation only in the terminal stages. Transient or respite sedation might be indicated earlier in the illness trajectory. Um, and only occasionally do the guidelines suggest using sedation for severe non-physical symptoms. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. They talk about special precautions around the non-physical refractory symptoms. And they say these are different because they're harder to establish that they are truly refractory. Because such symptoms, anxiety, depression, fear, um, are dynamic and changeable, and indeed adaptation is common. That the standard treatment of these symptoms have a, has a low intrinsic morbidity and that they're not necessarily indicative of advanced disease, unlike, for example, dyspnea, which often is. Um, and therefore, in the presence of these non-physical refractory symptoms, the guidelines suggest that they should only be used for patients with advanced... Sedation should only be used for patients with advanced disease, um, that it should be declared refractory only with repeated and skilled psychological specialist assessment, in a context of a relationship that's been formed and following trials of routine therapy, that there should be multidisciplinary approach in considering this, um, that if it's appropriate, then it should be used initially at least on a respite basis or a intermittent basis, and only continuously used if repeated respite trials have been performed and are not achieving sort of adequate relief. The guidelines um, suggest describing the evaluation and consultation procedures that should occur in the setting of sedation. So evaluating the disease, potential treatable causes, the prognosis, having multiple professional palliative care input into it. They talk about specific uh, consent requirements if the situation is non-critical. So this is a patient who, for example, you have time to, to talk through these issues. They say that we should, in, in these consent discussions, um, talk about the general condition, what treatments have been tried, the rationale and the aims of sedation, how it will be administered, what the anticipated effects and risks of that are, what care will be given during sedation, um, and also what the outcomes will be if, if the sedation doesn't occur. Um, the consent should involve an ongoing commitment to provide care and to the patient wellbeing and should involve discussion with the family if present. So it all sounds very um, sort of a bit overwhelming and almost a little bit bureaucratic, but they do make the point that in the case of terminally ill patients who have no advance directive, no healthcare proxy, and who are in severe distress while actively dying, then provisions of comfort measures is the standard of care and should be the default strategy for clinical treatment decisions. So um, I think that um, in the setting of severe distress, when you need to react um, <coughs> you know, quickly, then um, the, comfort, um, the comfort of the patient is the standard of care or provision of, of sedation is appropriate and, and may be 
instituted as the standard of care, not necessarily with all these consent procedures. So the guidelines indicate the need to discuss the decision making with the patient's family. They talk about the selection of sedation method, in general suggesting that the lowest dose necessary to relieve the suffering, unless it's an emergency. Potentially you may down titrate. Um, you may suggest going to continuous deep sedation first if the suffering is intense and refractory, if death is imminent, if the patient's wishes is explicit or if it's an end of life catastrophic event. The guidelines detail dose titration and patient monitoring and care and talk about the sort of balance between suffering, level of consciousness and adverse effects. Um, that doses may be increased or decreased according to the suppression of conscious levels and also according to adverse effects. Um, but if you're doing that, to document why, what the reasons are, what the response is. I think the issue of monitoring is an interesting one. Um, if it's a short-term intermittent sedation situation, then potentially um, monitoring of um, uh, vital signs may, may be appropriate and indicated. If the goal is comfort, and particularly if it's end of life, then monitoring is of their comfort and, and the sedation should be adjusted accordingly. Oh, getting close to the end of these guidelines, they suggest that there should be specific guidance around um, decisions of hydration and nutrition in usual medications. But the decisions around artificial hydration and nutrition is independent of the decision regarding sedation. And those medications directed towards the palliative management of symptoms should continue. Attention should be given to the care and information needs of the family and attention should also be given to the care of the healthcare professionals involved. <coughs> so those are the guidelines. What do we do in practice? Um, in a study by Classens published in 2011, a prospective study of 266 patients in Belgium as they were admitted to a palliative care unit, they found that 7.5% of these were administered palliative sedation according to those definitions and language and guidelines that we, we talked about. This was started a mean two and a half days before death. The patients had a, a palliative prognostic score of 40, um, had a good Glasgow coma scale. They were bed bound, but they did have extensive disease, but reasonably normal conscious state. They had an average of five symptoms, the most prevalent being listed there, pain, fatigue, depression, drowsiness, loss of wellbeing. 40% started as mild continuous sedation, 40% as deep sedation. Of note, 45% changed, um, and almost all of these went from mild to deep, indicating some titration against the symptom. And of those who didn't change sedation form, it started a median of two days before death, and in most cases it was a deep sedation situation. All patients gave consent. So the authors concluded that um, palliative sedation was exceptional, and when suffering was refractory, uh, it was for patients, reserved for patients near the end of life, and that it was a consensual process. Maltoni um, in 2012 published a study in the Journal of on Clinical Oncology, which was a, um, a systematic review of, of studies that exam or that reviewed, sorry, the studies were of patients who had undergone palliative sedation. And the authors were particularly interested in the survival of these patients. They identified 10 retrospective studies or prospective non-randomised studies, which included 34% um, of the total cohort of 1,800 consecutive patients were sedated. And you can see the range there from 15 to 67%. The reasons for sedation were fairly similar, delirium most commonly, dyspnea and pain. The mean duration of sedation was from less than a day to about 12 and a half days. Midazolam was the most commonly used drug in nine of 10 um, studies. Psychotropics were also quite frequently used, but usually in conjunction with benzodiazepines. Proportional sedation was most common, whereby the sedation was titrated against the response. Um, and few patients were given deep sedation at the very beginning. Survival from time of admission to the palliative care unit, for those who were sedated ranged from seven to 36 and a half days, for those who were non-sedated from four to 39 and a half days, and there was no significant difference between the two groups. And the authors concluded within the parameters and the limitations of these studies that 
actually sedation was not associated with um, reduction of survival. So in summary, palliative sedation involves refractory symptoms, where the goal is relief of symptoms. Um, we have guidelines that are fairly explicit and um, we should be thinking about or mindful of those guidelines when we're instituting sedation. But I guess really it boils down to really detailed attention to assessment, relief and level of sedation, as well as I think deep reflection on the intention in this situation. It should be proportional according to the response. So sedation, if you were achieving relief of the symptom, then um, the authors of the guidelines would suggest there's no requirement to escalate um, the sedation at that level. As best we can, it should be consensual with the patient, family, and I would also suggest the team in there. And it requires careful attention to family and staff as caregivers. I think there are some issues that the literature show, throws up for me that I um, believe require further consideration. And the first is how we decide or define what is refractory. Um, and I suggest that um, often it's really a definition that's in the domain of the physician or the healthcare team. And I'm wondering how, what role the patient in that. Um, how do we decide that this symptom is, is one whereby sedation is an appropriate response, um, whereby we don't you know, go down that route or that route? I think it's very interesting to consider in more detail this notion of refractory physical symptoms versus refractory, refractory psychological symptoms. Um, we regard them differently, and yet we know that they are intrinsically linked, um, you know, that dyspnea and anxiety are frequently um, linked and, and feed off each other, and, and, and yet we're talking about them as being sort of separate paradigms. I think the issues around consent are particularly um, interesting and probably throw up a number of challenges for me in my practice. Uh, I think the issues around the role of the family um, and uh, what role the family to either um, request or deny sedation in the attempt when you're looking after a patient who's at the end of life. Um, I believe that uh, the issue of raising this as an option um, with patients relatively early in their illness course um, raises interesting challenges and um, there might be some thoughts or comment around this. How do we enable consent and enable this as an option yet at the same time, you know, is that reassuring or indeed frightening for people? And artificial hydration and nutrition is probably something that... Um, uh, is worthy of further discussion, particularly in if sedation is being used earlier in an illness tra trajectory. So I'd like to pause there and um, I guess, as I said, the next part of what we're hoping to do this afternoon is to invite the panel up um, to the stage and we're going to go through a series of cases um, which I think raise interesting issues um, and I, I hope raise some of the practical challenges that um, get thrown up when we are you know, trying to integrate some of the literature and the conceptual things into our practice. So, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce the panel and starting from um, the far end is Dr Justin Dwyer. Uh, Justin's a um, consultant psychiatrist with particular skills and interest in psychosocial cancer care and psychotherapy. Justin's the acting medical director of the psychosocial cancer care team here at St Vincent's Hospital and he also works in private practice. He is interested in teaching and in research um, and particularly the researching the interface between palliative care cancer care and psychiatry. And Justin's a, a very valued member of our team. Next to Justin is John, John Dalla, who's a palliative care uh, nurse coordinator at Alfred Health.
John has been involved in this palliative care game for a number of years and indeed was, I was interested to read John, the first paid nurse at Mercy Palliative Care, um, which was then called Mercy Hospice Care. Um, he was really there at the foundation um, and Mercy has grown into, and John was part of that growth into a you know, very large and successful palliative care service. Um, in 1996, John left the community and rejoined the acute hospital and was really one of the, the founding members of the palliative care team at the Alfred Hospital where he's been ever since and has influenced the care of many thousands of patients and families, but also young and old doctors and nurses. <laughs> Next to John is Annette. Um, Annette Cadmore is a clinical nurse consultant in the Western Hume region. Annette's also been working in palliative care for at least 15 years. Um, and she has a graduate diploma and a master's in palliative care, also with a certificate in advanced pharmacology. 2012, she was awarded a Victorian Primary Health Care Research Fellowship with the University of Melbourne. So welcome, Annette. And finally, um, Dr. David Brumley, who um, his career, medical career began um, as a general practitioner and in his early years he was particularly interested in how older people died and this has sparked an interest in palliative care so he did some training in Western Australia and at Flinders before returning to Ballarat or coming to Ballarat where he was the director of palliative care at Ballarat Health Services and the medical director of Ballarat Hospice Incorporated. He um, was a foundation member of the chapter of palliative medicine and he's now a senior lecturer in the Rural Medical School, University of Melbourne and Deakin University. He's keenly interested in communication skills training, undergraduate teaching and has an interest in developing palliative care in the Asia Pacific region. So we have a terrific panel, um, lots and lots of experience and um, also a fair bit of Victoria covered geographically. Uh, so welcome and thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so these cases that I'm presenting are fictitious in that they're an amalgam of a number of cases that I've encountered in my practice. Um, they uh, have basis in bits of reality in, in different people, but in coming together and I guess forming a mosaic, they, um, they are... Um, um, created cases, but I think illustrate some of the points that we we're going to be encountering. Thank you. So the first case is of a man, Joe, who's 82. He has metastatic rectal cancer, colorectal cancer, and he has no further disease-directed therapy available. He's admitted to the acute hospital with constipation of abdominal pain, and these have been addressed, but he remains very frail. He's bed-bound, chair-bound, Spiked temperature last night and the RMO cover started him on antibiotics. And when you see him in the morning and he's very, very fatigued. He's quite comfortable, but really sort of a, more than a sentence or two and he's exhausted. A family meeting is held and the family uh, believe that the goals of care should be comfort. They believe that Joe should be looked after in hospital and they're considering maybe um, him going to a palliative care unit and they're going to sort of start doing some homework around <coughs> which one. His antibiotics have been ceased. He has occasional dyspnea and he's got some morphine mixture and subcut morphine if he requires. So you've had this big family meeting. It's been um, thoughtful and reflective and quite moving. <coughs> and you go and ring the medical registrar who's actually in charge of this patient's care and he says, to say what you're suggesting, and he says, sure, you're the M&M team. John, I wonder if you can tell me what your response to the medical registrar might be. Well, I guess the first thing that um, I would ask, because we were actually referred to review that patient by that medical registrar's team, but I actually had a question, I'm sorry, what is the M&M &M team referring oh, sorry. to? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, a colloquialism that you haven't heard, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, morphine and midazolam. Mm. So it's a sort of a slightly derisive um, team, okay. uh, notion, okay. yeah. Okay. Do you want to take a moment to reflect and let someone else? <laughs> <laughs> do you want anyone else would like to have a go, or John, do you want to have a go? Yeah. Iran or no. um, I think when I read this, Jenny, and I thought we we actually often get referred to made comments like that. Um, 
And I think the big thing for me would be around acknowledging um, with the registrar that he's obviously had some experience um, in some palliative situations. And, um, and I think that it would be really good to have the opportunity to have some conversation with them about, about those experiences and, and whether they were good or bad or indifferent. Because um, sometimes I think uh, we get that reputation because people have actually um, had a bad experience in palliative mm -hmm. care. And we actually have the opportunity to actually do a lot of good, really good teaching mm -hmm. and clarify some things. Um, I think the other thing to really reflect to the registrar is that um, that we have had a really good family meeting and that everyone is is on the same page and that we are, our aim of care is comfort care for this man. Um, and that, you know, that, that doesn't mean that we're just going to jump in there and sed sedate him. That What that means is that we're going to manage his symptoms um, effectively so that he does actually have the best comfort and quality of life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nick. There's an old aphorism called Hanlon's Razor, which goes something like, it's more like those sort of comments are more likely due to ineptitude or, or uh, apathy than, than, uh, than malice. Mm -hmm. And I suppose my initial response is do the same as you do with a patient and uh, don't react uh, emotionally and uh, wait for the opportunity to do some education, which you can do quietly in the longer term. Mm. And I think my only other thought in all that is too is what was the purpose of the referral? What was the treating team actually asking the palliative care service to become involved for anyway? Um, and the answer to that is is to gain the result that you already have from the, mm -hmm. the result of the family meeting. But to reflect that back to the registrar that we actually are involved in um, the same, we actually are involved in the same objective of care as, as the original treating team of which he's a part of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any other management that you would do at this stage for this man? He's on some morphine mixture, subcut morphine if he needs. Family are going to go off and have a look at the local palliative care unit. We'll give that to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, only one thing occurred to me really, and that is that the underlying problem uh, with which he presented is now fixed, is abdominal pain and his constipation. And I just wonder whether we should be thinking about fatigue and its causation a little bit, just sort of reflecting at least momentarily on whether there's something useful we could do to help. That's the only thing that occurred to me. Thank you. So that was Monday. Tuesday, you're on a routine ward round and you go up to review Joe around about 10.30, so just on the round. And you come across a bit of a mess. He was very agitated overnight. He was up and down constantly, he's calling out, taking off his clothes, clearly, you know, very delirious. The overnight nurse who was on called the cover, who over the phone gave an order for haloperidol, didn't come and see the patient. The haloperidol was given, one milligram subcut, and it didn't settle the patient. And Joe would remain sort of anxious or up and down, agitated, and very restless all night. There was no further medical contact. Um, currently, when you arrive, so 10.30 in the morning, um, Joe's in bed and he's seemingly sleeping. Um, the family are present and very upset. This is not what we agreed to yesterday. We were going to, he was going to be comfortable. Their father, dad's a deeply private man. This is the worst, you know, imaginable outcome for him. And maybe we'd be better off taking him home. You know, we can't care for him here. David, what would you say to the family? I think firstly, you need to apologise. Mm. This has been a bit of a disaster, hasn't it? And uh, a lack of continuity and a lack of good care overnight is uh, difficult to justify under the circumstances. So other than that, I'd carry on with a conversation about what I appears to be an acute delirium, reassuring the family about the causation of that and uh, going on to work out a cause and a plan of action. Thank you. And Justin, would you mind, um, would you like to comment on what you might like to do for his delirium? Yeah, I mean, it, it does sound like a very traumatic experience for the patient and the family. You know, they've left him on the Monday, they've returned on the Tuesday, and he's, you know, gone to pieces. Um, and not only that, as you sort of mentioned, David, you know, the, the team don't seem to have done a great job in managing this. I mean, a single phone order for one dose of haloperidol with no review, mm. uh, no contact with the family, no discussion with the staff. Um, it's hard to imagine how that would have really worked. Um, at all. And I think you know, the other thing that really sort of comes out of this interaction, aside from the opportunity to talk about, you know, the delirium and 
um, to, I guess, apologise what happened, I think is to just sort of talk about, um, you know, who this man is when they talk about him being a deeply private man, when they talk about what is really meaningful for him. Because often those things, well, I think invariably those things surface as part of a delirium, you know, the, the things which sort of, um, I guess, um, you know, the, the sort of formative experiences we have, who we are as people, how we respond to stress, the sorts of traumas we've had in life, all of those things sort of tend to surface. And there's a really good opportunity here to have a discussion with the family and with this bloke as well, so that he can have the experience, I think, of feeling looked after, so the team can see that, oh, sorry, so the family can see that the team are thinking about him as a man and what's important to him. And so that regardless of what happens from that point, um, there is a, a, a much more holding relationship um, with the service than there no doubt was at sort of one o'clock in the morning on the Tuesday that this occurred. John, did I think you want to say something? Yes. I think it's also interesting that um, it's not unusual that a family would actually feel that after their, the person they love so much has actually had that sort of experience, we're going to be able to do a better job at home, then you haven't done a particularly good job here. That's not an unusual question. I think the other thing that we haven't actually brought up too is that have we checked the reasons, and we obviously we would just check the reasons if there are any physically correctable causes for the delirium overnight. For instance, a bladder scan. Um, does he have urinary retention? Is he constipated? Yada, yada. Is he developing a, perhaps a chest infection? And um, well, we already know he was, sorry, he has got a chest infection. So, but is he developing anything that's readily correctable that we could have actually, did, we can actually do something about, particularly as the bladder symptoms or constipation? Thank you. Let's, so let's um, say that the family are, they settle down, but they are interested in perhaps taking him home. And there's no readily correctable sort of within his prognosis cause of his delirium. Um, and you think that he's going to require perhaps some level of, of sedation or sort of um, antipsychotics plus or minus sedation to manage at home. I'm wondering, are there any particularities around sedation at home? I just wonder if we give that <laughs> Any, uh, so is there anything, like, is it harder giving sedation yeah. at home? I think, I think um, when we're looking at the scenario and, and we're a rural patient, um, you know, quite a distance away, uh, one of the critical things is that perhaps we've got a management plan in place before we discharge that is, that is um, hopefully being effective. And I see an acute delirium like this almost as an emergency. We need to manage this well and quickly. Um, this is extremely distressing for the person um, who's in that having that experience, but also for the family and possibly even for the staff. Um, from a perspective, from the perspective of taking someone home with a delirium and managing them at a home, it's very manageable as long as we've done some really key elements. And those key elements are, are number one, making sure that we've got uh, a, a, a general practitioner or a medical officer who is well informed, who feels comf comfortable and confident in uh, delirium management, who has access to some uh, expertise resources, whether that be a specialist palliative care service or um, uh, a, a metro-based hospital. Um, also that we've got access to supports at home for that family and uh, the patient, and that may be just the district nurses, but it may also hopefully be a specialist palliative care service. I think the other thing that um, sometimes gets forgotten in the country is actually access to medicines. And uh, a lot of our small uh, rural pharmacies don't stop stock things like olanzapine and or a, a lot of those... Uh, uh, medications that we take for granted in our bigger hospitals. So ensuring that we do actually have access to the appropriate medicines and also that we've got, um, we've got a good plan for PRN stuff. Mm -hmm. We've got a good plan to an, empower this family to manage their father or uh, whoever they are to them effectively and well, just as though they were in hospital. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's a really good summary. I mean, the critical thing for me is that the family is united in their wish to do this. 
uh, that the patient is comfortable at the time they leave hospital uh, and that they have the means to maintain that comfort once they get home. And as you say, all the contacts are good summary. I mean, there's lots of other things too. I mean, the reason that people don't do discharge planning from hospitals very well a lot of the time is that it's so damn difficult to do it well. It's very time consuming, isn't it? And, you know, you could make a very long list of all the things and that's what we have to do when we're discharging people to get it right. The one thing that I would like to add to all this too is that if we are sending, we are contemplating going home, someone going home in this situation is that we actually have a medication regime that's been in place for at least 24, ideally maybe 48 hours of, of reasonable control to, to actually prove that in a sense that what we're sending a family home and a patient home to with actually works. Okay, thank you. Well, we might move on to our second case. And this is a case of Mrs K, who's an 82-year-old woman, woman with metastatic renal cancer. She was widowed some years ago, next of kin's a brother, and she has no children. Three years ago, she was diagnosed with renal cancer when she developed hematuria. She underwent a nephrectomy, but she had renal bed extension and local lymphadenopathy. She had radiotherapy to that area. But a year ago, she was diagnosed with metastatic bone disease and small volume lung metastases. Three months ago, she developed pain in her left femur and imaging revealed metastatic disease. This was surgically pinned and she had follow-up radiotherapy. And really since then, or before then, she's had ongoing severe pain. And she's now admitted to hospital with severe pain in her left femur. It's very severe. She's gone from really not much in terms of opioids up to Oxycontin, 80 milligrams BD. And she's having at least six breakthrough doses a day often more, and these breakthroughs often result in her becoming quite sleepy. She seems very distressed, but the nurses have noticed that when the family visits that she settles quite a lot and she has relatively few breakthroughs at that time. They say she's easily talked out of it. Uh, the palliative care um, doctor reviews her and she says, I'm suffering. And, and there's sort of some discussion around this including that if your leg pain was better, if your leg didn't give you pain, how would you be? She said, still I'm suffering. She's been seen by the psych liaison registrar who says she's not depressed. I'm wondering, um, and you're the palliative care clinician or the palliative care team involved in her care. I wonder, um, perhaps David, if I could ask you in the first instance, what might be your approach? My initial response is that the pain is the problem. And we know there's pathology in that area of this lady in, in her leg, in, in a femur. And I think that the comment that she's able to be talked out of it is no reason to suppose that the pain is not physical. I think the initial emphasis has very much to be on the diagnosis of the cause of this pain and fixing the pain if we possibly can and not on sedation at this point. I mean, for whatever reason, the pain appears to be opioid resistant, doesn't it? She's using relatively large doses of opiate without much relief. But that is no indication that the pain isn't real, as you know. It may well be uh, uh, irrelevant to opiates or non-opioid responsive for a whole range of reasons. So the emphasis has to be on diagnosing the pain and having a very careful look at the leg and using whatever imaging is reasonable under the circumstances to get a diagnosis and do what we can to treat it. The fact that the psychiatric registrar said that the patient was not depressed suggests to me that he might have missed the point, frankly, and I'd be interested to see what Justin thinks about that. But depression's not the only cause of distress uh, at the end of life, is it? And uh, it seems to be a rather narrow view of the suffering involved for this woman. And obviously, if we're going to do any good in a broad sense, we have to create some kind of relationship with this patient and uh, be able to talk things through. And once again, flowing from that, the necessity to get it comfortable before we do. Thank you. Justin, do you want to make some comments? I mean, this is a fairly common referral that, mm -hmm. that we get. And often the question is, does the patient have depression? And it's never, I think, as you're saying, David, as, as straightforward as that. I mean... Although I guess the sort of interaction centres around a complaint of pain and the need for medication, um, the, the relief that she gets if she does get any relief um, is likely to be sort of 
you know, far more complex um, than just having a tablet. I mean, she's getting attention potentially from staff. Um, there's company that goes with that. Um, you know, for, for some people who are quite anxious, they can find opioids actually reduce their anxiety. And so there may be this sort of unintended component of the, the medication which is helpful to her. Um, you know, th there may be lots of reasons, very personal reasons that she has why she is requesting and presenting uh, sort of wanting medication um, in this way. And I think that, you know, it, it, it is quite a sort of a glib response, I think, from the, the psychiatric registrar and certainly, um, you know, that comment, not depressed, without some context for who this woman is and why she experiences a pain in this way, how she sort of finds herself um, in the ward and needing to receive care, it's sort of meaningless and they haven't really answered the question, I think, about the referral at all. But, but I think it, it sort of also brings us back to this sort of core issue which you mentioned before, Jenny, in the presentation of suffering um, mm -hmm. and the whole person experience of suffering and how that's sort of conceptualised. Is there... Would... And any of the panel might like to comment on this. Would you raise the possibility of sedation with this lady? Yeah. And if so, how would you discuss it? And if not, is there a time when you would? Um, I might hand that one over to Annette. But I was just wanting to add, though, I think that the, the, the point of still, the point of the question being that um, about the lady obviously has pain in her leg, and that's obviously really important. But taking that out of the equation, she is suffering. And what does that... I would really like to sit with her and spend time and actually explore with her what that means. Is that loss of role, loss of value in the family, loss of mobility, all that sort of stuff too. Anyway. Mm. Um, Jenny, because I was actually going to be the, the pear in the apple cart because for me when I read this case and, and I heard um, David say, you know, we, we've certainly got to manage her pain... Um, but we've, I think to gain and to gain her trust, we've got to reassure her that we are going to do everything we can to relieve her suffering. And that if we, um, you know, I, I, was, I was actually going to try and get her to give us some time frames. So, like, I would like 48, 72 hours to try and get your pain better managed and then we will revisit your level of suffering. Let's get our, um, our psychology team back in and then we can revisit your level of suffering after that. But I would like to reassure her that we would, that, that there was the option of giving her some medication um, that that would probably uh, make her more sleepy but would still relieve her suffering. So I, I felt that it was important to, to actually open that conversation mm -hmm. a little bit at this time. So going back to sort of my talk, Annette, would you use it as primary <coughs> sedation or would you use an analgesic sort of, for example, as for secondary sedation? How, what would you consider? Yeah, well, I'm very, I'm very mindful that the analgesic regime she's on at the moment is, is not probably not the best and not appropriate. So um, I would have thought that I would probably, rather than primary, I'd probably be using it more around that secondary mm -hmm. sedation thing. So let's use your pain, let's get your pain under control, but let's also just add something in just to maybe take the edge off that anxiety mm -hmm. and that... Um, uh, and that may even be something as simple as just a little weeny bit of sublingual lorazepam mm -hmm. or something like yeah, that, very just to let her settle. And and I suppose to to uh, relieve her suffering while she is allowing us to perhaps manage her symptoms better. Mm. Thank you. Maybe it's a good time to point out that we ha we should remember that we are actually the therapy rather than the drugs we give as well as, I should say, the drugs we give. And the conversations we're having with this person are probably more as therapeutic uh, as anything else. Mm. So the third case, the third and final case, and these are, as you can see, perhaps, well, I don't know if they're increasing in complexity, but they're, you know, they're tricky. <laughs> and this is Joyce, 65, with COPD. She has long-standing oxygen-dependent disease. She's cachectic and wasted. She lives at home. She's fairly socially isolated. Her family are interstate. She's had two hospital admissions in the last six months. And she's on some MS content, 10 milligrams BD for her dyspnea. But when this is increased or she has occasional breakthroughs, it seems to make her a bit confused. She's now hospitalised again. She was found at home. 
really not managing, in bed, not coping. She had a little bit of confusion at the beginning, but that seems to have settled now. So since her admission, she's not been confused, but she's very disabled by dyspnea. She's bed bound and she's asking, is there anything else for dyspnea? And you as a palliative care clinician seeing her raise the possibility of perhaps some low dose, low dose sedation, some low dose anxiolytic midazolam. Have a long discussion regarding the potential for sedation and possibly even shortening her life. And she stresses she just wants to be more comfortable. It's okay if she's sleepy or even if she dies. So she starts midazolam five milligrams subcutaneously over 24 hours. And she has a marked response to this. She's alert still, but she's actually sort of sitting up in bed a little bit, moving around a little bit in the bed. She seems and feels better. Her son, Martin, arrives from Queensland and he's updated on her progress and her likely need, if she survives this hospitalisation, her likely need for institutionalised care. And the plan is to see how things go over the next few days. The next day, you're called to the ward by the nurses and Martin is wanting to talk and he's very insistent. You meet with him and he states his mother is suffering unbearably. You should end this, you need to finish her suffering. I know it's not legal, but it's what you do all the time. After all, you're giving her slow euthanasia anyway. I wonder what you'd say to Martin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ta. <laughs> Well, I thought about this a bit over the last couple of days. I think the first thing to do is recognise that there are, there's more than one person suffering here and that Martin's suffering uh, uh, greatly as well as his mum. And uh, he's suffering for a whole lot of reasons that we don't exactly understand and we really have to find out what's going on for him. So we've got to give him some space and some time and I think the trick here is to sit down and give him a bit of space and a bit of personal listening time and find out what his anxieties are and how he's, um, how he's coping with it. I would not respond directly to the comments or the accusation about the, the, the slow euthanasia, I would drop that and leave it completely alone because I'm hoping it'll become irrelevant after a half hour conversation. Um, I, I, I mean, five milligrams of midazolam in 24 hours, to my mind, is a very small dose of midazolam, and I would have always tend to think of that as an anxiolytic dose rather than a sedative dose. So I can't see that we're actually sedating this woman in any real sense at all. And actually, she's not sedated, so it kind of proves the point. The complex relationship between dyspnea and anxiety, we all know, don't we? So um, uh, that might be worth pointing out to him as well in a, in a gentle kind of way that actually this is very just a very relaxing dose. So, um, you know, the, um, I think that's probably as, as much as I want to say for now. Let someone else have a comment about okay. it. I might just keep going with the rest of the case. So you go and review Joyce and she's mostly awake still. She's mostly seemingly comfortable and she seems sort of happy with her current management. She's had two breakthrough doses of morphine and one of midazolam in the last 24 hours. So you increase the subcutaneous infusion to 7.5 of midazolam over 24 hours and leave her on the MS Contin 10 BD. Next day, Joyce is semi-conscious and tachypneic and Martin continues to insist and is asking for break, frequent breakthrough doses of midazolam and morphine for her suffering. The nurses on the ward are feeling very uneasy and quite distressed. And they um, don't perceive Joyce as necessarily suffering or being uncomfortable. So I'm just wondering, uh, again, I'll throw it open to the whole panel, if there's any comments or um, any thoughts about her management that you would like to say at this point. It seems like that Joyce's condition's obviously deteriorated. Um, the first thing to do would be to go in there and obviously we, we spend time, we go in there and assess Joyce with, with Martin. I do feel that Martin's probably quite unsupported. He's, it seems to be that he's a solitary. We don't know if there are any other siblings, but I suspect they're not. So Martin's carrying a lot of this load by himself. And I think looking at um, observing Joyce, observing her symptoms, making sure that she is not, and telling him why we feel that she's not not distressed. She certainly is tachypneic, but she's not distressed. Now, assessment is that she's not, and why we think that, and actually explaining to him what the processes that people actually go through when actually dying, I think, uh, are really important too. And we've seen that the pamphlets that we see around from the Cancer Council called The Process of Dying is often uh, really useful in, in this regard. 
um, people are often um, quite distressed because they actually don't know about what's going on. And we're let, letting um, Martin in on the fact that we are with him in this process, I would think, is actually really important. Um, yeah, any other comments? I'll just add one quickly and then I can hand over just... I think, um, I think actually um, educating him about midazolam and um, the effect that can have and that, that, you know, that's certainly relieving mum's level of suffering um, with the morphine and the midazolam. And the other thing I think for me would be to try and encourage Martin to find meaning in this time and to... Um, to spend some some really valuable time with mum, he's come from interstate, and how can we how can he reconnect with mum, and and what can we do to try and turn this from what he sees as a tragic, horrible situation into something that perhaps you know can can actually um, be something that he will remember as 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 mm. that he helped his mum in the last few hours and days of his life. I think the other thing to say too is that there's clearly a huge amount of anxiety in the room, a huge amount, and it's not just in Martin, it's in the staff as well who are sort of picking up on what um, it's like for Martin. Um, they're feeling that they have got to do something immediately to help out in this situation. It's a very high stress, very high pressure situation. And it's the kind of situation in which the anxiety can be such that you do end up doing something potentially not as thoughtful as it might be in karma circumstances, just to deal with sort of how tough things are. And so it may be that staff find themselves giving extra doses of PRN. It may be that there are sort of other things that they're doing or feeling induced to do, which really make them very uncomfortable. So, I mean, I think, you know, really the, the thing to do at this point would be, you know, if you've tried to have a discussion with Martin about, you know, looking at his mum, describing from a medical perspective what you see, that she's comfortable and so on, but you're still not getting anywhere, I would absolutely take him out of the room. I think that that would be essential at this point if he's able to tolerate that. Um, and to have a try and have a good long discussion with him about uh, you know, how he's dealing with this because it really does... I mean, he's a very... It sounds like he's going to be quite a high bereavement risk. It sounds as though... Um, you know, he, he really feels like he's going to sort of pieces here. And as his mum sort of declines, there may be more and more things which occur in this room, in this setting, which are very difficult to manage and cause lots of problems. So I think sort of getting him out and having a bit of a chat to him is a priority at this point. Mm -hmm. hmm. David, did you want to say something and then we might throw it yeah. open to the floor? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. There's one little trick that sometimes works for me and that is to actually spend a few minutes before we take him out of the room just sitting with his mother and with him and watching. If you sit down for a few, just a few minutes, three or four minutes, and you watch really carefully, at the end of that time, you can say to Martin with some real authority, Martin, I think your mum's OK. I think she's comfortable. That will be much more powerful than making some casual comment without actually spending a little space of time just watching. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a strong thing to do. I think it works pretty well. And of course then the issue of the nurses, we don't know why the nurses are distressed. It may be that they think we should be getting on with it or it may be that we're giving it too much. I mean in any case an increase from five to seven and a half of midazolam is neither here nor there anyway. Is it? <laughs> this lady's dying presumably of hypercapnic respiratory failure mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the kind of, you know, I think that's the underlying reason she's deteriorated, not mm -hmm. the sedation. Thank you. Um, I think that the cases have um, perhaps raised some issues and I'm mindful that it, it is actually 5.30 but, uh, and it's hot, <laughs> but um, if there are some questions and particularly perhaps here in the front. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the um, second case with the lady who was opioid resistant pain mm -hmm. and the, the fact that you noticed when a family were there that she wasn't complaining of pain but when they were gone she was, was suffering. So I absolutely love these situations because it's the most wonderful time to be able to get in and actually ask her. So what happens for you when your family leave? What sort of things are going through your head? And just really explore. And in the, in the third case, she did talk far more about the psychosocial, the psychosocial aspect of the patient's care. But we don't need to just grab the psychiatrist straight away. Anticipatory uh, lorazepam is a great idea, but it's great to be able to have those conversations and sort of mine a bit more for what her experience is and why it is worse for her when the family have gone. And, and the primary nurses can, can help with this. 
I mean, they're the ones that are giving the actual hands-on care. It's great if we can encourage them also to sort of delve a little more rather than immediately looking for a lorazepam or, or mm -hmm. for a psych review. Thank Just you. Just a comment. Take that as a comment. Yep, thanks. Are there any questions? I've been told that you've got to wait 15 seconds before you declare no questions. So, can you, can Yes, please, Annette. Can the panel can do you, that? Yeah, use, as long as you use the microphone, please. Um, I suppose I just, in amongst all these cases, and I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, because we have had, um, we've had numerous people request euthanasia and request sedation. Um, and I often wonder how, you know, how do people respond to that? And, and someone on the panel might be, you know, do, do you respond with, you know, it's illegal? You know, how do, how do you have a, how do you have a good conversation with, with someone around, um, no, we can't just put you to sleep. Would someone like from the panel like to have a go? Well, better answer. Let you answer your own <laughs> yeah. That's always a signal for me, I guess, to just ask, you know, we're, we're, it's part of establishing a relationship, isn't it? I, I don't think that there's actually a perfect, easy, easy answer to that one. I mean, I think that there are certainly situations where the reason that a person's actually asking is probably patently obvious because they're in distress and they're in extreme physical distress and have been in unrelieved physical distress for a long time, probably, or possibly. And if that's the case, the first step is to deal with that distress. And that's physical. I actually don't use the um, reasoning that it's illegal. I don't think I would say that to anyone because, uh, to my way of thinking, that's almost, in a sense, a little bit of a of a cop out. I think I think um, for me, what I often do is is acknowledge that where that that's actually coming from that a person that a person's is distressed. We probably do reach a bit of an understanding that we're not actually going to do that, but try our best to establish a, at least a trusting relationship that we will do everything we can to look after them patient as, as well as we can in all sorts of ways, but maybe, in fact, we'll agree to disagree. I don't know. Is anyone else? Well, again, it's a fairly common referral reason to psychiatry, um, a wish for hasten death or, you know, wanting sort of active euthanasia. But again, it, it's, it, it's just an invitation to explore, I think, and I can't ever recall a case where it has come down to it's illegal, these are the laws, you know, you keep asking, da -da -da -da. I, I can't ever recall that happening. Um, I think, in my experience, what's much more likely is that when you get to some sort of understanding of why they would want that control, um, you know, what it is that they feel that they are losing in the process of becoming more ill, more dependent, that, you know, that often um, hope and other opportunities, you know, arise, um, that they can be seen in the sort of the circumstances, even if it's things like hope about, you know, not having any pain or clearing up some unfinished business um, or hope about being free from uh, financial concerns, you know, whatever it is. I think you can all, when a patient brings it up, um, what they're really wanting, I think, is to have a general discussion with you. Um, about this horrible situation that they're in and to find something in that to sort of take away. Thank you. I might um, ask the floor again if there's any questions or comments. I'd like to ask a question. <laughs> We've got the panel, it just won't be quiet. <laughs> One of the most difficult times I think we find, um, that I find in my practice is sometimes is often retrospective when a person's actually died, when you've thought you've had the person really well managed up until about 24 to 48 hours uh, before they actually die, then they start becoming increasingly distressed and agitated and we've looked at all the reversible clinical causes and we look in retrospect that they've actually developed acute terminal restlessness or, or terminal distress. And I think that that's something that's probably, when we look back on people's death experience, if we haven't actually got onto that quickly enough and actually accelerated our doses of benzos, if we need to do that, and sometimes very rapidly, and um, using and and perhaps using even medications such as levo, um, or phenobarbitone, if you really need to be um, 
heavy dosage wise. I just wonder if other people on the panel have thoughts about that. If there's any way of really diagnosing a person or even looking at a person who's likely to, to develop um, uh, the warning signs, I guess, of people likely to develop an ex terminal distress, terminal delirium. It's a good question and I'm not sure I'm able to answer it fully, but I suppose the first thing to say is that undiagnosed low grades of delirium are a pretty potent um, indicator that something worse might happen. And I think we're often a little negligent in the way we assess delirium in its low grades and particularly in the withdrawn delirium when people are admitted to, you, to our services. And there might be a lesson there. That's just one idea off the cuff. Obviously, the presence of uh, a particular metabolic problems might suggest that it's uh, likely, you know, hypercalcemia, that sort of thing, once treated, may re-emerge in the, in the terminal phase. So there are things to bear in mind. But about your question, Annette, about, um, and about this question of the law, um, the closest I'd get to talking about the law in relation to a request to hasten death is to use it in a slightly um, jocular way sometimes and when people raise that kind of thing, if it's appropriate, to say, well, the first thing I have to tell you is that I can't bop you off. <laughs> and, and it does a few things, I think. It lightens the mood a bit uh, without being disrespectful and it also opens up the opportunities for conversation and you follow that kind of statement up with, uh, tell me what's going on, just open up, uh, using that to open up a conversation and to develop the relationship with the patient and find out what the underlying, if you can, what the underlying distress really is. Okay. That's great, David, because I think realistically, I mean, the euthanasia is in the media and, and people do want to have some form of conversation around it, so I think that's a great response. Okay, look, I'm mindful of the time. Um, you've been a very patient audience. <laughs>